Welcome to the Interesting Podcast, episode number 164. This episode is with my new friend, Keith Farley. He's a writer, actor, director, podcast host, and a whole bunch of other really cool things. I didn't realize how much we had in common until we hung out, and Keith was a blast. We talk about his fantastic podcast, Live from the Lounge, how we both played trombone growing up, where his interest in entertainment started, going from a PA to a director, why talent outweighs who you know, performing all over the world with a production of 1984, our favorite nuggets of wisdom, and so much more. Keith is awesome. You're going to love him. So, without further ado, please enjoy this episode of The Interesting Podcast, number 164, with Keith Farley. Theme song time. We're in hurricane season now, so it just has torrential downpours and then like a 15-minute window to check your mail, and then you run back sure. in for more. Yeah. It's not bad. Not bad. That's exciting. I like yeah. that kind of weather. I like exciting weather. Yeah. Yeah. Florida has that. It's a, The humidity is at a level where you have to swim through the air, you know? Sure, sure. Sure. An experience, uh, you know? Air, air stroke. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. You figure it out over time. It's supposed to get better, I hear, but I, I haven't hit that yet. I've been here a long time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not going to tell you the weather here has been lovely. So. Sure, sure. I mean, listen, I've been to L.A. a few times, and it's actually nice. <laughs> it's, it is. It's that's funny. The, I mean, that's the thing about it. I met a guy one time in New York um, in winter. Oh. And it, I, so I, I was staying with a friend, and he was out, so I walked down to the corner pub to have dinner, sure. and I struck up a conversation with a guy I was eating at the bar, and... Um, he said, where are you from? You're not from here. Where are you from? <laughs> I said, uh, you're right. You're right. You pegged me. I'm from Los Angeles. He goes, oh, L.A., huh? Well, you like it out there? <laughs> and I said, well, I said, it takes a little while to get used to living in paradise. But once you get over that, <laughs> he cracked up. Yeah. And I was yeah. like, y- if you take, what's, what's the temperature right now? And he goes, uh, it's uh, 27. Yeah. I said, yeah, flip that. <laughs> And you'll have the weather in Los Angeles right now. Jeez. Just flip it. 72, baby. So, yeah. Oh. But if you like, you know. So you like it here, huh? You like it here in in Queens. No. <laughs> yeah. Well, you like 27. Hmm. <laughs> Interesting. Interesting. Whatever. Interesting choice. Whatever. <laughs> he was funny are, you, are you good with cold? No. Me neither. Me neither. My blood's thinned out. I'm okay. Um, I like skiing. Oh yeah, yeah. I like to ski. Uh, oh. We ne- I don't never get to do it because like seven of the last ten years have been drought. Oh, good point. Good point. There have been just literally no, especially locally in LA. There's a there's a sure. little mountains to the east of us. Yeah. And if it's a good season, you can get some decent skiing going on up there. Cool. Um, which I did a few years ago with my kid. Right on. And then two years ago. I actually bought a pair of skis at a local like, there you go. secondhand sports store. I was like, sure. spend a hundred bucks, 150 bucks for a pair yeah. of skis. And then they pay for themselves. Even if I only ski 10 times right. in the rest of my life, I go once a season for the next 10 years Boom. or two times for the next five. Sure. They're paid for drought and then <laughs> COVID. Right. Two winters of COVID. Oh, not optimal skiing. No. <laughs> so I see them when I go out to the shed every once in a while. I'm like, oh, yeah, there's my skis. Right, right. Just to, just a reminder. <laughs> That'll be fun. One day. Yeah, one day. <laughs> I've never been skiing or snowboarding, really. Have you done, have you done snowboarding? No. Yeah. I, I, here's my snowboarding story. I was skiing for the first time in about 20 years. I took okay. my kids, and they were, you know, nine, seven, nine. So we'll sure. go up get a lesson and I'll go off and do some skiing. So we got our boots, we got our poles, we got rented, all that stuff. 
put them in their lesson, got on the chairlift, and I'm going up my first run, and I'm like, oh, I hope I remember how to do this. <laughs> that was my fear. Sure. And I saw these this beginner snowboarding class, oh. and it was people sliding down the hill and falling flat on their back. <laughs> That's all Perfect I saw. Going, <laughs> boom, <laughs> boom, <laughs> boom. And I realized in that moment that I will go to my grave having never snowboarded. Yeah, probably best. Probably best. The, the margin of error is so high with anything like that. I just don't have a day to just be falling on my back. Yeah. All <laughs> that's part of the experience, I find. You know, <laughs> you have to. I mean, that's yeah. the only way you're going to learn is by falling flat on your back. And again, you know, I thought, all right, that's a that's a younger man's, yeah, young woman's, as a younger person's game. Sure, so, the window is, window might have might have missed just a little bit. Might have missed yeah. the window. But that's anyway, okay. I don't mind. I like. Don't need it. I like yeah. skin. Skin works. Okay. I'm okay with two. That's yeah. what I learned when yeah. I was twelve. There you, you know, go. I learned how to do it when I was 12 and I remembered it came right back to me. And the oh. skis today are just so much easier. I went with my kid mm -hmm. uh, that one year, a couple of years ago when we did yeah. have snow. And he took a lesson. And then afterwards, the guy was like, what are you guys doing? You want to, I'll take you guys out a little bit. I can, I can skip the line and we can go. And I was like, great. Sweet. And he told me, he was like, the skis are so much easier now. All you really have to do, it's like being on an elliptical. You just sort of, oh. like you're going up and down on the elliptical, and the skis just turn themselves, and you get this great just sort of push, push, push with the skis. Whereas before, you used to kind of have to carve and then pull the skis together. He's like, you don't have to do that anymore. Wow. Skis are shaped differently, so it's really just a weight transfer from foot to foot, and they just do it by themselves. It was great. Really? Anyway. That's like I've heard about like bowling is the same thing. Like the technology for bowling is so much better now. Where before, is that like, the, true? Yeah, yeah. Supposedly, like the old lanes were like actually wood, and the balls were made of different material. Whereas now it's like significantly easier than it was in like the seventies and eighties. Huh? Isn't that wild? That is. Yeah. I can't imagine the bowling technology. This right? doesn't seem like two words that go together. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Outside of the technology, which I love, yep. which are the pin, the pin setters uh -huh. and the, the little thing oh, that yeah. goes up and down, all that stuff has fascinated me since Same. my first memory. Yeah. The first time I saw it, I was like, that's the coolest thing ever. Right? I'm so, see, same. And then yeah. everyone else is like, oh, it's just pins. I go, no, no, no. There's like a factory back there doing all kinds of cool stuff. It's awesome. Coolest machinery yeah. ever. I and totally then, agree. Yeah. But I still like to keep score. Yeah. By hand. Yeah. Why not? And that like way, you know, you. it's like the big Lebowski, you know, yeah. like can get really intense. You have the market zero, you know, yeah. you, you get it. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> I do. All right. That's going to be a good conversation. I can tell. You know, you know, and also you have the coolest spelling of Keith I've ever seen. Yeah. And that's from someone whose middle name is Keith. Not spelled ah, the same though. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah, was a uh, man. I wish mine was spelled your way. It's so much cooler. <laughs> you could do it. Yeah, that's true. Go you know, ahead and gotta, you're not changing your name. That's right. That's on my to do list. You know what? Right now. There you go. Change to Keith. Boom. Keith. Keith. Yeah. Do you get, does it get mispronounced a lot? Yeah. Sometimes. Yeah. Every yeah. once in a while you get a Kathy or a Katie. Uh, oh, yeah. I can see that. I can see that. It's yeah, like it's... I've seen like Miley is the same. Like you can have it. Spelled M A I L E, and they're like, Maley? Ma Male? Yeah. It's like, oh man. Yeah. Some Oof. people are just not good pronunciators. Yeah. <laughs> we'll get to them eventually. We'll, we'll figure get it to out. Them. We'll figure you it know? out. I'm sure we will. So I know because I've listened to every episode of the VO Lounge, which is, ah. whew, we'll get to that. It's very, okay. very good. But it's good. interesting because normally I'll have somebody on and I know next to nothing about them. But I feel like I know quite a bit about you because of your show. There's so much of you in it. And True. it's beautiful. Like I know uh, you're from you're from Sacramento. I am from Sacramento. And then I know you moved to LA, so you're not from there. True. You know? You I know? am a California native, but not I've lived here for thirty five years though. So That's true. Do you say that's where you're from? Like when you talk to people, you're like from LA? This is definitely my home. Yeah, gotta be. Los Angeles is definitely my home. And when I was a kid, I lived in Long Beach for a bit, too. So oh, cool. you add those three or four years, plus the almost 40 years in Southern California. And yeah. 15 in Northern California. 
Yeah. What is home? Where I'll give, is it, home? I'll give it to you. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Another thing we have in common, you played trombone. So did I for like seven years. Funny you would mention that. Dude. I was talking to John Ballinger, the, our musical director, on Live from the Lounge, and I reminded him that I played trombone. Yeah. And he reminded me that I played trombone in a show that he MD'd. It was a, uh, it was a production of the Nutcracker, but John and his partner Ken had taken all the pieces from the Nutcracker and given written words. Oh, so instead of da 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 da, da you were singing, yeah. I am going over this way now. Oh, uh, cool. And we all played musical instruments. So I played the ukulele. Um, Same. Awesome. Yeah. John taught me to uh, a couple of chords on the mandolin. Ooh. I didn't have to do like any of that sure. stuff. <laughs> but he taught me some chords on the mando. And then for a couple of the pieces, um, grabbed my trombone and Dude. played in. And he was like, "How long? When, when was the last time you touched it? And I said, eh, it's been a few years. I mm -hmm. said, but I really, I would like to be playing it. Yeah. more often than I do. And he goes, you got to just get it out. Mm. So a couple of days ago, I ordered a trombone stand. Ooh, I like it. From yeah. Musician's Friend. So I'm going to assemble the trombone. I'm going to set it right here, just off screen. And hopefully on breaks and lunches and whenever the hell I feel like it, yeah. I'm going to pick it up and honk on it a little bit and see if I can't remind my embouchure yeah um, what Bring it, it feels like yeah because i uh, loved it i played it for almost 10 years straight cool. I played from third grade um Ooh. all through high school played in a dixieland band jazz band marching band concert band yes um i was in the ucla marching band for wow one one game that um, counts and I, I got very very sick and had to withdraw <laughs> uh, that quarter, but I got that one game in. That's what counts. It's yep. the boxes checked. I did the, all the rehearsing that was necessary. I was on the field every day for weeks and weeks. Oh. Um, that was a really great experience. I've never talked to somebody else who also played trombone. This is nice. What? Why did you pick it? Did you get assigned it, or, or did you I didn't have it? a choice? Oh, okay. <laughs> My dad had a trombone, so that's what I was going to play. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I forget what I wanted to play. I think it was either trumpet or clarinet. Uh -huh. um, it was when I, when something I was my desire, um, sure. but I did. I fell in love with it eventually. Yeah. Well, and if you heard the podcast, you heard about learning how to read music. This, that yeah. was my like, most recent one. Mm -hmm. Was that experience at um, summer camp? Yeah. Like having faked it yeah. for like a year <laughs> and a half. Yeah. Because I was again that move from Long Beach to Sacramento just put me way behind. Yeah. But I sort of just faked it to keep up. And then, like I said, that moment in in jazz band when you, there's no hiding in jazz band, nobody For else real. is playing your part. Uh huh. Um, and all of a sudden, like I said, like I said in the podcast, that bass clef just. Yep. I looked and I, I found I saw F, and I knew that that was F, and then everything just sort of opened up from yeah. F up and down. I was like, okay, so that's a G and that's an E and that's a C, and I okay, I got mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And from that point on, it really took off, um, and I fell in love with it, and and got a proper trombone instead of my dad's clunker. Sure. When I was in eighth grade and played that all through high school and college. That's awesome. I yes. love the trombone. I still have an ear for it, so whenever I hear a song, I'm like, "That's a trombone right there." Yep. Boom. Totally. You get it. Yeah. <laughs> I I love. It I, happens I, to be my vocal range. Oh, so. perfect. <laughs> So even when you don't have the actual trombone, it's in your heart. Yes. It's always there. Yes. I love it. I That episode of your podcast actually gave me a flashback because when you mentioned, you're like, oh, there's an F and it's on this line. And then here would be an E. I was like, that's an E flat. And you're like, that's an E flat. And I was like, it is. Oh, and I like had this weird, like <laughs> looking at the music. And I was like, I remember these things. <laughs> yeah, good. Well, that's the idea. I mean, that's sort of what the podcast is, is there to do is to sort of spark you uh, yeah. to sort of excite your brain and to get yeah. you thinking and and feeling and laughing and tapping your toes um about stuff so i'm glad to hear that that's doing that for you oh yeah we, we all of it not in common it's it's uh, it's doing a lot of it 
because I, I listen to a lot of podcasts just because that that's what I like to do while I'm working and doing things. Sure. And when I came across yours months ago, I was like, this is it's almost like a a proper variety show as if it was like on TV and there's just no picture. Like it's so curated and it's, I love the segments. It's so cool. As somebody who has a podcast listening to yours, I'm like, what is this new brush of paint you're using? Well done, Keith. Well done. Thank you very much. It Good. is, um, it's not easy. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> that's, that's another thing I'm listening to it. And I go, I can, I can smell the work it took to make this happen. <laughs> yeah. It's been and and it's something that we're sort of trying to set up that can be live oh, cool. um, as things begin to open back up. So yeah, that'd be have, fun. We could conceivably do these shows live, um, and that's the idea. Um, we're not doing them live because of the pandemic uh -huh. um, and separated. But for the last radio show, uh, the Father's Day or the 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 um, summer camp, summer camp. Mm -hmm. sketch, we recorded right here. Oh, cool in the lounge this right is the, the vo lounge oh that's actually it oh cool. you're looking at it i know this is a oh. podcast and not a. this is just for me and you keith they don't yes. need to know any of this so this is where it comes from this is where i sit and do all my mixing work and there's a soundproof booth behind the computer and oh, cool. uh, yeah this is where it where it originates um and i built this a few years ago um after the the interactive strike in 2017 oh um, sure just thinking like i don't know what's going to happen with interactive if it comes back right great and if it doesn't what am i going to do with myself sure um, and so i built this vo lounge with the help of of, of george widham uh, and a guy named mark shouten uh, and my wife who kind of came up with the idea of giving it a lounge feel cool so you can sort of see that the cool oh, i love it yeah, How when cool I called George that? and I was like, "Hey, can it, can we make those um, baffles? Can we make those diamonds instead of squares?" And he was like, mm, "Yeah, boom, ninety degrees." <laughs> yeah, wives, man, they know what's up. They do. Yeah, so it's my wife was go. just like, "It should be like the VO Lounge." I was like, "I like it." Yeah, I'm in. So Stamps. the podcast is live from the lounge. Um, live from the lounge podcast. Mm -hmm. Easiest way to find it is to search the weird spelling of my name. Yeah, if you pop in K E Y T H E it pops right up boom um, there were a few other live from the lounges that sort of came and went over the years mm -hmm. but if you put in k-e-y-t-h-e it'll be the first one that that pops up another thing we have in common with a show as ambiguous as the interesting podcast it is near impossible to find but if you search brian balance with two l's right there on everything see look at this we broke the code already keith <laughs> <That's it. laughs> <laughs> let's start an empire let's do it let's figure it out we'll have branches you know of just nonsense <laughs> i'm all about it it'll all be a good time this. oh man so i <laughs> where so i know okay so you you were in sacramento you moved to la where did your interest in entertainment start because you've been doing it for so long like yeah. you know like was there a moment where you're like this is kind of what i want to do where it's where it's stuck there were a couple of moments like yeah. that one was one was completely based in greed sure uh, which was i just remembered about the time that you know in my home my parents subscribed to time magazine sure uh, and we got the the newspaper every oh, yeah. day mm -hmm. so i would read the newspaper even as a seven eight nine ten year old i would kind of look sure. at the paper in time magazine i always found fascinating and in 1973 Paul Newman and Robert Redford made a movie called The Sting. Uh-huh. And they were both paid, I mean, I think the a million dollars each to be oh. in the movie. And I went to see the movie and loved the movie because it's a great, great movie. movie. Yeah. Still yeah. a great movie. Yeah. Um, and thought, you get a million dollars for doing that? <laughs> <laughs> I want to do that. Yeah. And, you know, nobody at eight years old tells you, well, there's only a <laughs> handful of people who get a million dollars to do that. Right. <laughs> but I just never stopped. I just kept doing it. Oh, uh, yeah. I was always in choir, in uh, band, in plays. From mm -hmm. that moment on, um, talent shows, anywhere that I could get up in front of people um, and play or sing or dance or perform was something that I started doing <clears throat> and um, 
out of in high school, I was fortunate enough to have a radio station on campus. Cool. So I learned radio. Yeah. In high school. And by the time I was a senior in high school, I was DJing at the top 40 station in Sacramento. Um, K-R-O-Y. I was 2 to 8 a.m. Sunday mornings. I went in at 2 in the morning, (laughs) DJed till 2.40, and then played public affairs programming all night long till about 6.30, and then got back on to DJ from 6.30 to 8. And it was a dream come true for a 16-year-old kid. Yeah. Yeah. to do that. So I dabbled in radio, ultimately sort of grew a little disillusioned with it. I realized it was going to be a lot of work for not a lot of money Mm -hmm. until and unless it became, you know, went to San Francisco or Los Angeles or got syndication, became a Casey Kasem or a Mark and Brian or And I just felt like, is that really what I want to be working towards? Uh, And I'd sort of fallen in love with acting at that point. Had a gig at Summerstock um, Company that summer at the Western Stage in Salinas, California. Mm -hmm. Um, Did that for a couple of summers and then realized I'd sort of outgrown the market in Sacramento. Um, And so transferred to UCLA to finish my degree. Uh, and I'm glad I did. I met a lot of the people that I'm working with today. Um, oh, cool. Like Mitch Watson, who's a, a showrunner. He's done Scooby-Doo and Batman. And yeah. Mitch and I met in school and did a lot of writing and performing together. And um, it hooked me up with the Actors Gang, which has been a cool. huge influence on on my life. And that's where Bat Boy came from. Right. Um, we developed um, the show... Um, with the actors gang um and uh put it on at the actors gang and then it sort of grew and exploded out from there so never really a question what i wanted to do sure it was just a matter of when was i going to get paid to do it yeah it's always been (laughs) a thing too right it's like the business and the show aspect it's like totally i love i love all of it it's um and discovering coming back to voiceover mm-hmm. um, was really huge for me. I mean, I, I had done some on-camera stuff in the early 90s. Right. Um, I like to say, like, <laughs> the, I had my first on-camera gig on a show called Full House oh, in good one. 19, 1991. And then in 1992, The Real World premiered on MTV. Okay. And that was the beginning of reality TV, which Uh then took over Mm -hmm. network TV. And I watched my agency, which represented small to mid-level actors like me. And I watched them go out of business because there was the movies of the week gone. Right. You know, um, network TV was now cable was coming in in 82 Sure. Or 90, 93, 94. I mean, cable was really accelerating uh, at that point. And it eventually kind of took over. And middle class actors were hard to come by sure. um, in the in the 90s, in the early aughts. Um, and so I went, ended up at um, Klasky Chupo, the animation house that produced Rugrats and oh, the early sweet. seasons of The Simpsons. Yeah, yeah. Tracy Ullman days. Um, Duckman, a show called Duckman. Yeah, this this my childhood. You're talking. There you go. Uh-huh. Um, and my wife was working there as a PA. Cool. Uh, and the show went on hiatus. Duckman was on hiatus, mm-hmm. and so she picked up a job at Spumco working f- with John Chris Felusi, who created Ren and Stimpy. Right. And so she went over there and was having a blast working for them. And when her job came back, she said to me, "You should go be a PA." And I was like, why would I want to do that? I'm an an actor who occasionally has to wait tables to make ends meet. Why would I want 40 hours a week? And she goes, what are you going to do with your life, Keith? (laughs) It's a good woman you got. She's good. I'm telling you. I said, I want to write and direct and act. And she goes, well, guess, guess who's in that building over there? There's writers in that building. You should go meet them. Mm -hmm. There's directors in that building get over there and get in their face and actors are coming in and going every single day. Mm-hmm. So one of the first jobs I had at Klasky was, um, craft services 
for the oh, cool. So I was the guy that bought the bagels and the cream cheese and yeah, Pez dispensers and put them all out and sat there and received all the great actors, the um, right. Greg Burgers and the E.G. Dailies and the Tress McNeils, um, Jason Alexander's. Like everybody came by and started building relationships and with Barbara Wright, who is the casting director. Mm -hmm. um, and after sort of working my way up through the production uh, ladder to uh -huh. manager, coordinator, associate, producer, producer, um, it wasn't, I enjoyed the money. Of course. I enjoyed the, the benefits very, very much, but I was having chest pain. I was stressed out. Budgets and schedules are, are things I can do. Yeah. They're not things I'm great at. Yeah, understandable. And they it stresses me out. So I went to my boss and I said, hey, listen, <clears throat> Bat Boy was starting to take off at the time. Right on. Um, and we had done this crazy one-off film festival in Park City with my partner, Brian Fleming, called Slum Dance. Oh, sweet. Which was... Great name. It was really... It turned out to be <laughs> kind of a big deal in Park City that year. Right on. Um, <clears throat> we were on Good Morning America um, and got Ooh. a lot of got a lot of press and the independent film channel ifc recruited brian and i to work on a show called split screen that oh. um, john pearson produced for ifc back in the 90s mm -hmm. um and so we we started doing these pieces for him we had to write bat boy because it was opening Sure. <laughs> on Halloween in 1997, and we needed a script. Sure. So I went to my boss, and I was like, hey, listen, I got to write this show. And I got these independent film channel thing is sniffing around. Can I take like 10 weeks and, you know, figure out what's going on? With things? And she said, well, we've been thinking about you. The new creative director at the studio feels like he can talk to everybody on staff except the actors. He's just not quite sure how to communicate with actors. But knowing you senses that you that might be a good that you might be good at that do you want to take over voice directing rugrats Dude. you'll work a couple days a week and you'll make a bat what you're making now and then you'll have your free time to go do your ifc and your bat boy and all that stuff so that was a great great gift wow that coming up through the production ladder gave to me yeah um, and rugrats the cartoon, the series became Rugrats video games, mm -hmm. um, which introduced me to everybody in the video game world um, that I've been working with for the last 17 years. Oh, that's so cool. I love hearing stories like that because it is that way. You can start as a PA. Today's PA is tomorrow's director. Yeah. Like there is a way to do that. And it's also really cool. And I'm not surprised now that you're building those relationships with those people because that is how it is. Like it's, it's who you know as well as like what's the relationship there because you want to work with cool people right I like it I, I tell my students all the time it's like the, it, it is there's a, there's a who you know aspect mm -hmm. but there's also a talent yes aspect yes that weighs it outweighs it and I always tell this story I think so too um, I'm gonna leave the name out okay. it was you can use Brian okay <laughs> <laughs> so, I'll give it to you <laughs> I'm not sure if that's gonna work okay, never mind um, Ryan. Anyway. <laughs> so yeah, Ryan or Bri. Yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Brian. Yeah, that's um, it. Brian. Perfect. We got it. So I'm directing one day and they, they come in and they go, listen, the 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 producer's hairdresser has got a one line part in the episode today. He they, he says he wants to be a voice actor and he's coming in to do the part. I was like, Okay, send him in. We'll be fine. I'm sure it's fine. One line, it's an old timey radio announcer. Um, oh. And the line was, um, that was Bill Bailey, won't you please come home? And I'm sure he will. Up next, a little ditty called Bicycle Built for Two. And that was the start of the episode. And then there was right. this little fantasy of uh, the old timey songs, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, very busy day. Hectic, hectic, hectic. Okay, next up is the, uh, the hairdresser. And I was like, great, send him in. Let's do this thing. And he sits down and I, don't, I just get right to it. Uh, listen, um, it's just this one line. We just want it to be really up, really bubbly, kind of announcery. So whenever you're ready, I'm sure you're going to be 100% awesome. Just go. Sure. And he goes, that was Bill Bailey. Won't you please come home? And I'm sure he will. 
Up next, a little ditty called Bicycle Built for Two. I'm like, <laughs> I turned to the story editor, I'm like, what's, the, what's with the French accent? That's a, what's a weird choice? <laughs> <laughs> so I leave, I'm like, um, interesting choice with the accent for this old timey radio show. And he's like, I don't know what you mean. My accent is not accent. It is just the way I speak. And I was like, Ooh. Okay, well, can you do an American accent? And he goes, uh, no. Oof. I said, okay, well, let's let's just try it again. And what I want you to do is just really up the energy and the pace. Just give me a really energetic, just really just mm, go for Get it. it. He goes, okay, whenever you're ready, we're rolling. That was Bill Bailey. Won't you please come home? And he finished his second take, and I, we, I might have done a third. I doubt it. And I was like, "Great, thanks." Cool. And, and he left, and I went to see Barbara Wright, the casting director, and she was like, "How was he?" I was like, "He's French, Barbara. Yeah. <laughs> He's French. It's not going to work. It's not going to work." And so that's he got into the room. Right. He got into the room because he knew somebody. Mm -hmm. But when he, he's not getting back into that room. Right. He's right. not coming back because he doesn't have the, the gift. He doesn't have sure. the talent. He hasn't done the work. Yes. To get to that level. And it's a competitive field. And yeah. the most important thing, that's why my, my business is kick-ass voiceover. Yeah. Because if you kick ass, you'll work. So I'm working with students. I'm always working myself to try to give the best performance you possibly can. Yeah, totally. I, I, that makes ass. sense. Get the material and you just kick ass. So that when you get that opportunity, when you're styling someone's hair uh, yeah. <laughs> and they go, <laughs> yeah, I write for, you know, um, family guy. You, 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 you give you a one liner. Yeah, no problem. You go in and you kill it mm -hmm. and you end up on the show for the rest of your life. Yeah, totally. Oh. It's like that second adage. It's like, it's all, what is it? It's like who, you know, gets you in the door. Talent keeps you inside. Something yeah. like that. Like, yeah, Absolutely true. hundred percent true. Keeps the door sense. open. Yeah. Keeps the makes, door open. Makes sense. Makes sense. So yeah, the who you know is is an aspect of it, but that's just sure. a matter of just being. I mean, it's funny because in the theater, mm -hmm. you get to know people by dint of being in shows. Yeah, true, true. You know, you meet people all the time, and then they go, "Oh yeah, there's a friend of mine's doing a show, and you'd be great." You yeah. Know? Oh, did you hear about this? And you sort of get into that. In voiceover, it's often solitary. I mean, in animation, it's often gr group records, mm -hmm. but in video games, promo, commercial, all that stuff, it's a, it's a it's a solo game. So the idea of getting out and pounding the pavement and meeting people is a little harder. Sure. Do you get better, like, because you've done it for so long, if it's, because it's solitary, do you get better at, like, directing yourself? over time like does your ear get trained where like that's good that's not good like how do you know yeah well i mean that's that's the million dollar question yeah how do you know and it gets down to you know some of what i teach which is um can you understand what you're saying that's good a point. big part of it are you clear are you a clear do you have clear diction mm -hmm. um and then the other part of it is you know just does it make me feel something um, so it's that, I, that technical precision and emotional availability that go hand in hand. Um, and so learning to hone that, learning to develop your ability to connect to the material mm -hmm. um, emotionally and to perform the material so that it can be clearly understood are the two, the two those are the bulwarks right. of, of voice acting. Um, and I, so I, I train people to, to do both. Some people come to me who've never spoken in a microphone before. And I'm like, okay, tongue twisters, oh. you know, read Fox and Socks. Right. Um, D. Bradley yeah. Baker's go to man. Totally. Yeah. Totally. You start, start there and build your chops. Do the lips, the teeth, the tip of the tongue, the lips, the teeth, the tip of the tongue. Yeah. You know, 
um, all that sort of stuff, and just get your get your mouth moving, and then we'll start to introduce what what are you what are you feeling, and right. not that you have to feel what the character is feeling, but you need to be able to portray it with a level of sincerity. Sure, um, and that's and all those both of those things take time. Totally, that's why training is important. Right, mm -hmm. it's right. a craft. That's what I love about acting is that it is a craft. There's, there's a technicality to it that gets lost in the kind of flowery language of what acting is. There's also, by the numbers, ways that's a technique. I think it's so cool. Derek Jacoby, the great uh, British actor, uh, was quoted one time to me. It's maybe apocryphal, but hey quoted to me as having said, when you are on stage and the role is playing you, and the muse fills your body and three hours go by and you you wake up at the end of it and you wonder what happened. There's nothing like that experience for mm -hmm. an actor. And that happens 10% of the time. Sure, the other 90% sure. is technique. I love it. And I believe that's true. You, I, I always want to be sort of loose. That's why we do like these crazy warm up and relaxation exercises to just sort of be loose yeah. so that you're available sure, for things sure. to happen. Um, but 90% of it is technique, is being able to help other people feel what the character is going through. Sure. I, I remember I watched a talk one time as one of those like actors on actors videos, and it was Adam Driver, and he went to Juilliard. And one of the things he talked about was his job is not to have an emotion, it's to convey an emotion to an audience. He's like, whether I'm sad or not, doesn't matter. Because if I'm sad on camera and the audience isn't registering that, then I'm not doing my job. I was like, oh, I've never heard it put that way before, but makes sense. It's makes it's sense. absolutely the way I feel. I think he's absolutely 100% true. Yeah. Um, Brian Cranston put it a, a, a different way. In a video that I saw of him, he said, um, I used to think of auditioning as job interview. Oh. That I was going in to apply for a job. Sure. As an actor. And he goes, and things really changed for me when I stopped looking at it that way. And I started thinking of it as creating a moment. And my job is to create a moment in the room. And so when, once I walked in with that intention, he goes, the, the gates open wide and I've been working ever since. Wow. So, I like that. It's, it's really re good. It's real. It's real. That's the, it's really good. I like if that. Can, if you can go in and create a moment. Yeah. With those people, especially in, in person. Yeah. It's a little harder when I walk into my little tiny booth with my microphone and. Sure. Okay. Got to create a moment. Let's create a moment. Yeah. And without that human energy interaction and not to get woo woo about it. Sure. That's what happens when you're in a room with people. Absolutely. 100% agreed. We've all been to a concert and you've had ecstatic mm -hmm. experiences. You've been moved to tears. You've gone to the movies and you felt it. There's an emotion that happens when people are in a room near each other. True. Um, and when you're by yourself, it's trickier. And that's where yeah. you just got to keep trying and get better at it. Sure. Sure. How long was it? Because you worked your way up from the production side and then you're directing episodes of Rugrats. How long was it before you're like, I'm doing this acting thing? Like going on across the table. It was another one of those things, Brian, that I just, it was a, a, a moment where I got a little bit lucky. Mm -hmm. um, I, I I went down to the actor's gang awesome. um, one night. They were uh, workshopping uh, a new adaptation of George Orwell's 1984. Sweet. And so I went in just to sort of, I read the script. I went to dinner and I read the script and loved it. Sure. And just went to the workshop just to kind of see my pals and um, see what was going on. And just to sort of say, yay, go do this show. It'll be great. Yeah. Support. And my friend Brent Hinckley was like, I got to hear you as big brother, dude. Ooh. I got to hear you as big brother. And I was like, nah, I'm not, <laughs> I don't want to do this show. He's like, no, come on, come on. You got sure. to do it. You got to do it. I was like, okay. So I went up and I ended up doing a reading some of Big Brother and then did the scene with O'Brien. I don't know how well you or your listeners know the book. Mm -hmm. um, 
at the end of the book. Spoiler alert, if you're yeah. planning to read 1984, <laughs> sure. tune out for two minutes. Yeah. <laughs> um, at the end, there's this big, the, the, the main character is sort of captured by the state mm -hmm. and then he's deprogrammed by this dude called O'Brien mm -hmm. who has identified for Winston, the main character, what the worst thing in the world is and it's rats. So he brings right. out this rat cage and he puts it on his head and finally gets him to betray his love and his state and everything. So that was the scene that I was doing. Ooh. And I got up on stage and my kids at the time were like four and six. So I sort of, and my daughter had had some health issues and my son had had some health issues. So I'd kind of been in the hospital with them. Sure. And so I just sort of played it the way I played it with them when oh. horrible things were happening to them, just as a patient father, like, yeah, okay, this is going to suck, but it's going to be fine, and you're going to get through it, and you're, we're going to do what we need to do, Ooh. okay? And you hear the audience, people in the audience are like, <gasps> yeah, <gasps> you know, because there was no mustache twirling, and all of a sudden, like I said, it was that thing of, which I learned from George Bigot, who is with the um, Théâtre du Soleil in France, mm -hmm. was to just don't push, don't force, and don't deny. Yeah. So I was just on stage, just as relaxed as I am talking to you now, but playing this moment, and it just sort of was that Derek Jacoby moment where the, yeah. script, the script played me. Um, and so Tim Robbins, who was directing the show, came up to me Ooh. afterwards and was like, you want to play O'Brien? <laughs> he would know. And I was like, let me check with my wife. <laughs> Let me check with my wife. Smart so man. I went home that night. You know, I got home at midnight or whatever, and I crawl into bed next to my wife. And she's like, how was workshop, honey? And I said, I kind of feel like this is, a, this is a big break for me. Yeah. Doing this role in this show feels kind of like a big deal. I don't, it's just a little show in a 99 seat theater in Los Angeles, but it, it, it feels like a big deal to me because it was really, this weird thing happened to me on stage. It was like I was totally taken over by the character and blah, 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 blah. Yeah. So, anyway, it did turn out to be a big deal. We toured the world with that show for six what? years. What? Really? Um, yeah, Dude. we were, we went to Hong Kong and played at the Opera House. We were like the headliner at the Hong Kong Arts Festival. Um, I played opera houses in Spain, which was what bonkers to be able to stand on a stage in an opera house. And I realized as I was standing downstage center that I could speak like I'm speaking to you now and be heard by everybody in every seat because yeah. the acoustics were so good. I didn't need a microphone, so I got to play everything really down. So there we played in Madrid, Barcelona, um, Bilbao, Melbourne, Australia, uh, Athens, Greece. I mean, we played all over the world. And we wow. came back here and there. I wasn't six years on the road. Yeah, but still. Uh, I had well. children. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they forgot who you were. <laughs> who I was pleased to raise, and I love them yeah. really. Um, of course, of course. But we came back and we did a, a three-week stint here in L.A. At the, at the Red Cat Theater, which is at the Disney Concert Hall. Mm -hmm. And I thought, what the hell? I'll just send out some postcards. Sure. And see what happens. And I had an agent who called me after it, saw you in the show, loved your work. Um, I want to rep you for commercials. And I said, okie dokie. Yeah. Your agency also has a VO department. She goes, how do you know that? I said, because I cast and direct voiceover. And she goes, yeah, you want to meet Kelly Marie? We can get you on down there. I said, okay. So she took me down the hall and I met Kelly Marie and they started sending me out. Um, this was 2008. So it's about 12, 13 years ago now. Um, and that was kind of the transition from being mm -hmm. writer director sure. Keith to being director actor Keith mm -hmm. um depending on what you know how much money you're making sure to being actor director Keith some years director actor Keith some years sure and the bat boy royalties have sort of played themselves out but mm -hmm. there was always that little infusion every three or three to six months where it'd be like oh awesome. how nice there's there's the rent for the next yeah. couple. Um, so that was kind of how it turned around for me was that just showing up at the actors gang yeah. at night just to go 
go get them guys. Um, and I, it ended up handing me a, a career in performing and in, in voiceover. Yeah. Um, you know, I never booked an on-camera commercial, but mm -hmm. I booked a lot of VO commercials. So. Wow. Um, yeah. I love that. It's like you were just a good friend and look what the universe did. Boom. Yeah. I yeah. like that. But then goes to yeah. show, do the work because you had the talent to be able to do it from the experience. So luck is preparation meets opportunity. So you had the prep and the opportunity. You got lucky. Lucky, quote unquote. <laughs> right. It's Yeah, the Sam Snead <laughs> quote about golf. Um, yeah. <laughs> golf is a game of luck, and the more I practice, the luckier I get. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That That's was very so much cool. it. Did, that was very did, much it. Did you find that audiences, depending on where you were in the world, was there like a, a commonality between them or a difference between them at, in reaction to the show? It's a really... I mean, when you're doing a show that's being subtitled oh, or yeah. super titled, you know, in Spain, in, mm -hmm. I don't know if we had, I don't remember having most of the Greeks speaking a fair amount of English, but in Spain and in China, mm -hmm. we had super titles or in China side titles because they read. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Um, so that's a trip because the audience is, is looking off to the side to get the words and then kind of coming back to you. Oh yeah. Like this, you know? Um, but in the, in the English speaking territories, even mm -hmm. across the States, um, we played a lot in, in, on college campuses cause it's a great teaching opportunity. Yeah. Used all over the place. Right. And they've all got big theaters. So mm -hmm. that's a great place for booking agents to sort of look sure. and, and drop you in. Um, but no, the uh, it was it was interesting um, in China in particular. The we we had done some press before the opening. Cool. And one of the the journalists had asked, um, "Do you know about what's going on in China? What do you what do you know about you know our government and the situation with Hong Kong right now?" Smart. And this was two thousand seven, two thousand eight, uh, somewhere in there. So before good, good briefing. It, before it was today, but there was some tension. Yeah. I said, you know what? I'm really sorry. I said, we don't get a lot of news about China in the United States. I'm kind of a news junkie, sure, but I don't sure. really know a lot about. I know that there's that Hong Kong is a or was a British territory mm -hmm. that's being handed back to mainland China mm -hmm. and that they're in a process of doing that. So I hope that process goes well. Yeah. <laughs> um, but once I had performed the show for an audience of Chinese, mm -hmm. you could hear a pin drop doing 1984 wow. in Hong Kong. Oh, in yeah. 2008. And the gasps that would go up as we would say things that Orwell had written that mm -hmm. these people were living. Yeah. <gasps> this collective gasp that would go through the audience. And I would have had a lot more to say about the situation in Hong Kong just after one performance. Yeah. Because they, it was then that I realized that they had booked this show intentionally uh, as a great big middle yeah. finger to mainland China. Um, and I was, it was pretty cool to be part yeah, of. Yeah. Right on. Isn't that beautiful about art? How it translates, like it transcends all of that stuff. It's like totally different ways of life. And like the truth is there in the text of what the art is. It, it's so much. Ah, I just love it. Yeah. It's amazing. It. And to be able to spend that much time with a book that has become so yeah revelatory in the last, I mean, when we started 2006, so the last 15 years. Mm-hmm. The the lessons of 1984. I mean, we carry telescreens. Yeah, we are communicating via a telescreen um, right now, and and that that the technological aspect of it, the sort of um, fit in with society or mm -hmm. watch out, watch your back, yeah. is definitely a feature of many societies all over the world, including our own at times. Yeah. Um, so it's been to be able to really, really live inside 1984, or at least the, the adaptation of it. Sure, um, sure. For for 
for six years was was a gift. It was just a gift. I bet. Yeah. So awesome. So I I just saw um Ibsen's Enemy of the People a few years oh. ago. And I'm thinking about that in today's context. And I was like, oh no, when was this written? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we're still the same. <laughs> we're still the same. Okay, cool, cool. <laughs> People don't change, man. We had they a don't. Dude. <laughs> I'll never forget we were in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and we had a dude who was trying to sort of reframe the of show. Course. And uh <laughs> He would say, wouldn't you agree Ooh. that Orwell's vi dystopian vision is most evidenced uh, by the Taliban? Oof. And I said, the great thing about Orwell is that <laughs> he understands how totalitarian regimes work mm -hmm. and whether that's a, a left wing totalitarian regime like Stalinist Russia or mm -hmm. right wing regime like Nazi Germany. Mm -hmm. I said the 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 precepts are the same. The the sort of control of society is very the same. The propaganda um, yeah. ministry. Um, people having to pledge their fealty and their loyalty to the state or yeah. to the to the person yeah. um, is very much a feature whether you're the Taliban or Nazi Germany or Stalinist Russia mm -hmm. or Bolsonaro in 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 um brazil or you know here in the united states it happens yeah it's true you know people are still people people that's are kind people. of the, the best and worst thing about it <laughs> and he gets it and and orwell <laughs> man does he get it yeah um, and just these little thin volumes that he that he wrote um that just contain so much truth like per page the level of truth in 1984 oh, yeah. astonishing and it's also a great adventure story it's true. a great kind of a spy thriller. Yeah. Um, so there's that part of it too. It's kind of a fun read. Is it kind of crazy thinking back, especially cause like you did theater and then you got into production that you're doing like cartoons and like video games. Cause we're in like a golden age of video games now, as far as storytelling goes, yeah. do you ever think like, even from acting that you would be stretching these kind of muscles? It's a surprise. It's a constant yeah. surprise to me um, <clears throat> that I've been able to over the course of my career, do all the different things that yeah. I've been able to do from directing and writing and acting and producing. Yeah. Putting, yeah. putting on a film festival um, really? in six weeks. We, we put cool. that, we went from Ooh. zero to Park City um, from January 10th. And we, we were in Park City doing our thing on January. Wow. 20th. It was bonkers. So cool. all that stuff, it's just a matter of, of, of Frank Zappa had a great quote. I love all the quotes that we're getting in here. Yeah. Right? We got, we got too nuggets much of fun. wisdom. We'll just nuggets throw them back. from the greats. <laughs> yeah. There's a reason they're there. <laughs> yeah. Zappa says, if you want to be a composer, write a piece of music, get a people, group of people to perform it in front of another group of people mm -hmm. and repeat. Ooh, I like it. And then it. you're a composer. Yeah. Whether you're making money at it. Sure. Whether you're, you know. Because um, you did it. You wrote music. You, it was played you, for an audience. Boxes are checked. You are a composer. So get over yourself and just do the work. Yeah. Um, and that's always been, I sort of thrown myself at the wall and see if I stick. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> over and over again. And sometimes, you know, I have failed spectacularly uh -huh. uh, in my life and um, have also had great success. Um, sure. You know, that's how you do those things. Are you good at that? Like allowing yourself to fail to learn? I mean, failure is never fun. Yeah, true. But yeah, you do. You learn from it. You have to. You and a lot of the time... <laughs> If you're me, you're sort of blind <laughs> to it. You're just like six That's months later, you go, whoo, yeah. what was I thinking? <laughs> what was I thinking? And then if you're if you're neurotic like me, you start to go, well, what am I doing now that I think is really yeah. cool? Yeah. That, and then you got to learn to get off your back in that regard. Yeah. You got to learn to get off your back in that regard. And mm -hmm. 
throwing that monkey off is sometimes a challenge. Yeah. Um, but again, if it's if it's what you want to do, yeah. Um, if you want to be an actor, get in the show. Yeah. It's all get part of show. it. Go on stage in front of other people, mm -hmm. uh, and then you're an actor. Congratulations, you did it. You are it. Yeah. Um, and whether you're getting paid, whether you're, you know, I didn't make a ton of money touring with 1984, but what an experience. I bet. Um, with great people and doing this wonderful piece. Yeah. Um, so my wife and I have the, the three-pronged rule of a career in entertainment, which is good people, mm -hmm. um, artistically satisfying material, and money. Smart. So, if you're getting one of those things, you can let the other two go. If you're working with great people and the show's kind of sucky and you aren't getting paid, well, at least you're hanging out with great people. Oh. If it's a really fun show, the people are kind of assholes and there's no money in it, and, you know, at least you got at least you're in something that's sure filling the soul. And if you're getting a bunch of money and it sucks and the people are terrible, okay. At least you get the bills can, paid. At least I can pay the bills. So you get two. Then you're you're gold. You're in good shape. Yeah. And every once in a while, you get all three. Every once in a while, you get the trifecta, and you're in a show with amazing people, working on an amazing project, and you're getting paid really well. Um, and that's just there's nothing better. Yeah. There's that's when it's better. like your spirits filled up. Yeah. Yeah. To the brim. Yeah. To the brim, and that's a big part of it too. Is the you know there is a spiritual aspect I think to it. I think so too. I think so too. Is, just sort of understanding and that's kind of what the coming back to the podcast yeah the idea of getting in tune with the seasons of the year yeah and getting in tune with the idea and i learned this i worked um at a presbyterian church in the oh, late cool. 90s i wrote and directed church awesome um, for three years and it was great for the chops because you got a one hour show Every yeah. week, and that's not not a, not to diss anybody who you know totally uh, religious, but it is you're putting on this one hour performance every week totally, and you got to just keep going. You can't mm -hmm. stop to think about it, and that's what kind of got me off off my own back. Was like, yeah, it's going to be great or it's going to suck. Um, but sure. six days from now, there's going to be another one. Yeah, um, <laughs> <laughs> that's theater, and, you know. Yeah, that's what the and the pastor told me when I first sat down with him. He's like, Keith, you have to understand, Sundays are relentless. Yeah. They never stop coming. And I was like, yeah, that's why I'm here. That's what I want to do. Yeah. So, but as I was doing it, I started to notice that the liturgical calendar mm -hmm. matched up with the seasonal calendar. That as we're heading into the Advent season, mm -hmm. where the world is getting darker and darker, we Presbyterians light candles. Oh, yeah. And you look and you go, oh, yeah, well, it's getting darker. We're going to be like, nope, we're going to yeah. light this candle. <laughs> Where the light's coming back, we know it is. That's Eventually right. It's going to happen. And the Jews have Hanukkah, and then there's the Kwanzaa celebrations. And it all goes back to the Yule log. Yeah. It all goes back to bringing in a tree from outdoors, which is a, a tradition that the Germans came up with. It's mm -hmm. not a tie to any religion whatsoever, but it's this thing that we humans do yeah. to say, we're hopeful. Yeah. Right? And yeah. then you get into the the season of Lent, which is this sort of season of doing like penance. And that mm -hmm. that comes in the dead of winter. Yeah. Is no coincidence. And the fact that Easter, this idea of coming back to life happens in in the spring. And I started to clock this and I was like, oh, interesting no wonder. And that's the way the world works. Yeah. The world goes through this constant cycle every day. Yeah. From birth, growth, withering, death, new life. It happens every okay. single day. You watch the our earth spins around and it flies around the sun and the seasons of the year do the same thing. Um which is why in the January podcast it was like mm -hmm. don't start yeah. anything. <laughs> yeah in january <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's just not the right time nothing no. grows no nope. in january Nothing. if you want something to grow and i started to do this in my own life i started to think in january mm -hmm. well what do i want to do this year 
Right. Where do I want to go this year? And so you plan it and you start to think about it. You don't do it. Right. <laughs> you start to think, well, I would like, you know, to to do more writing this year. I would like to, you know, um, uh, be there cultivate the relationship with my wife and my family yeah and have that be um a lovely thing and then as it starts to move out of the winter months march which we've talked about in the podcast as mm -hmm. being you march back yeah. into the world and that's when you start yes. with your new projects that you've been planning for yeah. in the darkness of winter while you're cuddled up next to the fire mm -hmm. wishing it would be a little bit brighter outside <laughs> You make your plans and then you execute in March. Yeah. And then hopefully by this time of the year, things are going, things are growing um, yeah. and things are cooking and things are happening and it's crazy and it's wild. And you, you see the fruits of your labors, of your sowing and your planting. And then yes. hopefully you get a chance to take a vacation when it's too hot yeah. to work. <laughs> you get to a, Go to an alpine lake you head to the beach you go to cancun you head someplace where you can relax and and re recharge for the yes. harvest yeah which the reaping when this is when everything comes in and hopefully um by the time you get to thanksgiving you're you've 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 had some success with your goals mm -hmm. and then you sort of head back into the winter months with this sort of store and then you start uh -huh. to think okay now what do i want to do next yeah. What did I learn? Start recalculating. Right. Yeah. Right. And then it's that cycle that just goes round and round and round and round. And so I noticed that, like I said, working with the liturgical calendar in the, sure. in the Christian tradition, but also noticed that that also goes connects to to the Tao, you know, yep. this idea of the yin and the yang, which are constantly in balance with one another, the mm -hmm. day and the night, and that within the darkest night, there's a little spot of white light mm -hmm. within the brightest day there's a little spot of darkness and that that's the way that's just the way life is yeah and that when you can again throw that monkey off your back mm -hmm. and get in the flow of that that cycle of birth growth withering death new life yeah then you can really then you're really cooking it's just it's just the way things are yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's you start to go oh okay that's right. the way that's the way the river's wrong <laughs> right i would notice that i mean i think i spent this in the podcast too that every winter i just sort of noticed that i would get a little depressed yeah in totally. winter, i start to think like that's a thing this cold is not a cold this is a disease sure i'm I... certain i'm not gonna make it to see 27. <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah. And start starting to accept that that's just part of it. So yeah. in February, I'm just always sort of like, yeah. Even in sunny Southern California, when the days are still short, sure, nights are still long, and you don't always get the vitamin D. Um, yeah. And you know, it's okay to be a little depressed. And totally. February. So get off your own back about it, and you start to realize that these things are all part of the way things actually are. Mm -hmm. And once you can learn to accept that things get better. That's cool. And I think really important. It's important to have that mindset of like, when you learn to go with the flow, you kind of give yourself a little more of a break. Then you can be your full self because you're not being dragged down by everything else that's there. I like yeah. that. And then you just put these intentions in place. And again, I see sort of, like I said, January, February, start to think about, all right, I'd like to, I'd like to, you know, have a little more something or I'd like to yeah. try something new. I mean, it's, I'm going to, um, take up the trombone yeah but don't um, start it in january because <laughs> <laughs> you might have to get a trombone yeah. and a stand and look for a teacher who's going right. to take you down the, especially if you've never touched it before yeah but yeah start slow and then build and then as the year goes by you sort of grow and you get better at it and maybe you get to play in a in a brass band at christmas time yeah is there because you do a lot of teaching and stuff like that is there a common pitfall you see that like a lot of people make as far as like what's what's holding them back from doing their thing or like teaching do you see a common denominator i think it's it's fear yeah that um, makes sense it's fear it's always it's some sort of some sort of variant on fear 
Mm-hmm. Um, someone's afraid to. This happens to me all the time. Here's one that I that I get a lot. Mm-hmm. If I get someone who's a little, whether it's culturally, or in a family situation, someone who's just more reserved. Sure. Emotionally, I tend to be more demonstrative. I want to. I'm bigger, especially in performance. I tend to go big and then pull back. Sure. Um, so when I'm see when I see somebody who's having trouble with that, um, <clears throat> and I work with them, and all of a sudden there's a spark. Yeah. And you sort of know when that spark happens, and all of a sudden their ability to read goes out the window. <laughs> you'll get this little flutter of emotion from this person and then all of a sudden they're stumbling over their words again and and sure. then they <clears throat> and they shove it all back down <laughs> and they go back and i've had a couple of students and this is fairly common where i just i say like you can't go back yeah for, for now you can't go back when that stuff happens, I want you to keep going because every time you go back and you clear your throat, you're sort of locking down what's happening sure. emotionally. Yeah. And we don't want that. You have to push through this. And it's hard. Your left brain and your right brain yeah. screw with each other a little bit. When the emotion starts going, the left brain is like, ah, 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 ah. Yeah, <laughs> we're going. <laughs> yeah, and it's the right brain's like, yes, all the feelings, yeah. <laughs> all the feelings. We got this, man. <laughs> and the left brain's like, well, well, I got, I got, kind of, da. Yeah. <laughs> so it's that, it's that thing, and, and it's the brain and the heart. I think that's the, yeah, you know, that again, however you describe it, left brain, right brain, head and heart, um, technical precision, emotional availability. Yeah. That's what I teach. I mean, that's my, thing so you could be really technically proficient and dull Mm -hmm. you could be really emotionally available but you can't be understood right so finding that balance is always a challenge but i find more often than not it's with once when the emotion comes out Mm -hmm. the technical precision that first little bit and falls apart sure the scatter shot yeah, indeed. Yeah. I'm into that. I'm into that. Well, dude, we've been talking for over an hour already. I can't believe I like, it. I feel like this was 10 minutes. <laughs> it doesn't seem right. Dude, this was so fun. <laughs> yeah, I can't believe me you said too. yes. <laughs> I mean, no. listen, the blackmail helped. I understand. But still, kind of <laughs> worth it. <laughs> I love my dogs so much. That's, that's right. Say it Please louder. Them. Please Clear. give them back. Uh huh. Clearly, clearly. <laughs> <give them> back. <laughs> I need you to enunciate, Keith. Let's roll this back. <laughs> Technical precision. There it is. There Take it is. Two. Slower. <laughs> yeah. It's Dude. this has been really, really fun. Um it, it's a joy it's, getting to know you. This was awesome. I had yeah, such yeah. a good time. So I have to before I free you into the wild. Yes. Uh where can people find you online? Where do you teach? Huh? What's what's All going on? Stuff. Yeah, let's let's plug it. Talk to um, me. I am on Twitter at Far O'Near. Love which, it. You heard that story uh-huh. on the podcast this month. The podcast is live from the lounge Keith, with Keith Farley. Mm-hmm. You can find it on your all the platforms. Uh, we're on Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeart, TuneIn, all the, just put in K-E-Y-T-H-E. Get uh, it. It'll pop right up. Um, I'm on the uh, Instagram at Keith Farley, K-E-Y-T-H-E, F-A-R-L-E-Y. Um, and Facebook too. Um, KeithFarley.com, K-E-Y-T-H-E-F-A-R-L-E-Y.com. Um, you can sort of take a look. That's sort of the forward-facing performer site. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's some information about my my bio there. Um, use that to reach me for coaching classes. Fantastic. Coaching over Zoom. Uh, or if you're in the Los Angeles area, I'm getting ready to throw the doors to the VO Lounge wide open. Awesome. Um, but I do a lot of work with folks. I'm also on a new um, platform called Skills Hub. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you mm-hmm. do you know Skills Hub. I, I saw you there. I saw your name on the schedule, Mike. All friend. right. You've been doing a little, little, uh, <laughs> you know, little work there. You and you know. can book me by the minute there. That's the great thing. If I'm doing yeah. a Zoom class with you, it's by the hour. Um, mm-hmm. But Skills Hub is by the minute. And that's just skillshub.life. It's, awesome. it's really great. I like it a and lot. There are so many 
good coaches um, created by Jennifer Hale, who genius. is a genius. You're absolutely right. Yeah. And that's not a word I bandy about much. No, for real. Like in, in so many ways. Yeah. She's on another planet. Yeah. yeah. The rest of us are just trying to keep up. That's right. That's right. We get the glimpses, like the Haley's comments of just like, wow, I'm glad I was here. <laughs> <laughs> well, she asked me on the interview for the thing, and she's like, what would you tell your younger self? And I was like, I think I'll tell my younger self to work harder. Yeah. And she was like, and every time I say that, people go, really? Yeah. <laughs> you work really hard, Keith. I'm like, yeah, but it pays off. That's right. I'm not dead yet. So. And if I had worked harder in my teens and 20s, mm -hmm. um, you know, and I'm now? happy with where I'm at. Yeah. Uh, but I would tell, you know, totally. you know, Keith, Keith, who was open in the, the newspaper and like, OK, what, what's yeah. the, <laughs> is there an 11 o'clock movie? OK. And then what about the two? Th but you know what? That's also going to school. Yeah. So yeah. true. I had a really special therapist who told me that. I was like, well, dude, that's that's your profession. Boom. You're going to you're you are in school. You're going to see other people work. So, but um, getting that trombone on the stand, yeah, next to me so that I can pick it up yes. and play. Um, so that's the kind of work that's like, yeah. If I'd spent a couple more uh, half an hour a day at the piano, I'd be a better piano player today. Totally. So that that sort of stuff, like, yeah, knuckle down and do it. Um, but she was shocked by that. I was like, yeah. <laughs> I do work really hard, but <laughs> I feel like there's a little more in the bottle. Just there's just there's always just that little something that you can do. Um, That's right. That's with right. your time, and again, to do something that that brings you joy. Yes. Playing the ukulele, you know. Yep. Yep. I love it. It's a it. joy to sit here for 20, 30 minutes, and I know I'm going to the mountains in a couple of weeks. So I'm going to be able to sit at the campfire every night and play for forty five minutes or an hour. Yes. Um, every day and that was and before we go i'll tell you this last story sure please what i realized having children mm -hmm. was that i was practicing voiceover every day Ooh. seven days a week yeah. i was reading to my children for 15 to 45 60 minutes a night yeah. And I realized this after, you know, four or five years of doing that, that, oh, wow, I'm getting really good at this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You've clocked getting, the hours. <laughs> because you clocked the hours. Yeah. And it wasn't something that I was doing with that intention. Sure. It just so happened that when you got a six and a four year old mm -hmm. uh, or an eight and a six year old, that for those years, you read to your kids if you're a good parent yeah um, and it's fun and that really really got my chops from pretty good to really yeah. good yeah i bet so have kids have kids got it easy <laughs> have kids <laughs> i love it i love it right. and Hello, friends. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Interesting Podcast. If you'd like to follow the show, it's at Pod of Interest on Twitter. If you'd like to follow me, I'm at Jedi Brian on all social media sites. You can also find me at BrianBalance.com. There you'll find all my demos and a bunch of other fun stuff. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it and tell your friends. A good rating or review always helps and is greatly appreciated. Let the people know we've got some cool stuff going on over here. Speaking of cool stuff, we now have merch! Just search The Interesting Podcast on tpublic.com to get you some sweet gear. Also, I've got a Patreon, so if you'd like to support the show more directly, you now have that option over at patreon.com slash jedibrian. On that note, special thanks to Chris, Ben, Jim, Daz, Kelly, Daryl, Xavier, and Victor. Your support means so, so much, and I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. So until next time, be well. <laughs>